Thank you, Brian Malone. Uh, what Brian just did was just a simple mindfulness meditation. My hope is that everyone is now more present, uh, and there's a sense of peacefulness in the room that um, we sometimes lose. Brian does this uh, on a longer, more extended time period on Thursday nights at 7. And so if this is something that's good for you, or something that you haven't even tried, you should show up on a Thursday night and uh, let Brian help you uh, become more present and, and centered. It's a good thing. So uh, I'm glad that you're here and welcome to the quest once again. Uh, as you can see, I'm not here. I'm in Pennsylvania spending uh, about a week with my mother and father. Uh, but I didn't want to lose our momentum in this God series. It seems to be uh, very helpful to a lot of people. And so today we're going to do something a little different uh, and in a different way, but I think that we'll maintain our momentum and continue to move ahead in this understanding uh, of who God is. And um, this morning I want to talk about God as a kindergarten teacher. God is like a kindergarten teacher. Now that explains why you have some of the supplies you have uh, at the table that you're sitting at, and it explains why uh, our children are sitting with us. It's both a very good thing. So here is our first uh, thought experiment, uh, first exercise for you. I want you to think about the God that you grew up with. Uh, I don't know your background specifically, but my sense from getting to know a lot of people and my own experience is that the God that we grew up with wasn't the most benevolent uh, God. And, and so I want you to take a few minutes and just write out what you remember and what you hate about the God that you may have grown up with. Now, you may have gotten information from a church experience or from your family, uh, maybe from your friends or from TV or uh, movies, but any of that, just draw up in your own mind and then write out in the paper in front of you a description, descriptors of that God and what you specifically hate about that God. Take a few minutes. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Christine's going to help us with all these exercises, and um, I'm grateful for the uh, feedback from the kids as well. And uh, remember, they're here because we can learn from them, right? So I want to do another exercise with you. This one is the opposite of the last one. For the last several weeks, and really for the last several years at the Quest, we've been learning about uh, God in, in reality, what God is really like. What may be true about this God that uh, we're here to learn about? And so for the next few minutes, I'd like you to write down things that you love about that God. Now, just as a reminder, in this series, we began by saying there, th that this God leaves us clues uh, to her existence. Um, fingerprints, as you will, if you will, to, to let us know that God really exists. And then we said during the second week that God is like a homegrown peach exquisitely delicious and um, better than we can possibly imagine. God, in essence, runs down, is so juicy, he runs down our chin. Last week, we said God is like an intimate logistics officer. In other words, God knows, because he's an outrider, the, the deepest needs of people wherever they are, and he sees the fact that we have resources to meet those needs, and God is in the business of putting the logistics together so that when people say yes to him, amazing things happen. So what is it that you love about this God? I mean, things that you hope are true, but can barely believe would be true. I'd like you to take a few moments and write those things down. I've recently reread a book called Orbiting Giant Hairball. Uh, it's one of my favorite books. In the book, the author gives us a thought experiment that really helped me get a handle on how much God was for me in my life. I want to lead us through that thought experiment now. So listen as I read it, and then I'll give you some instructions. Before you were born, God came to you and said, Hi, I just dropped by to wish you luck and to assure you that you and I will be meeting again soon, before you even know it. You're heading out on an adventure that will be filled with fascinating experiences. 
You'll start out as a tiny speck floating in an infinite dark ocean, quite saturated with nutrients and everything that you need. You won't have to go looking for food or a job or anything like that, and you'll, all you'll have to do is float there in the darkness. You'll grow incredibly, and you'll change miraculously. You'll sprout arms and legs and hands and feet and fingers and toes. And as, as, as if from nothing, your head will take shape. Your nose, your mouth, your ears will emerge. And as you continue to grow bigger and bigger, you'll become aware that this dark, oceanic environment of yours, which when you were tiny seemed so vast, is now actually cramped and confining. That will lead you to the in unavoidable conclusion that you're going to have to find a bigger place. All of this will be what the big people on the other side call being born. For you, it'll be only the first of your new life's infinite exploits. God continues, I was wondering while you're over there, on the other side, would you do me a favor? Of course you chirp, sure, sure I will. Would you take this artist's canvas with you and paint a masterpiece for me? I'd really appreciate that. Beaming, God hands you a pristine canvas. It's blank and white and pure. You roll it up, you tuck it under your arm, and you head off on your journey. Your birth is just as God predicted. And when you come out of the tunnel into the bright room, some doctor or nurse looks down at you in amazement and gasps, Look! This little kid's carrying a rolled up artist's canvas. Knowing that you don't yet have the skills to do anything meaningful with your canvas, the big people take it away from you and give it to, a, to society for safekeeping until you have acquired the prescribed skills requisite for the canvas's return. While society is holding this property of yours, your canvas, it cannot resist the temptation to unroll the canvas and draw thick blue lines and little blue numbers all over its virgin surface. It takes that pure white canvas and makes it into a paint by number exercise. Eventually, the canvas is returned to you, its rightful owner. However, it now carries the implied message that if you will paint inside the blue lines and follow the instructions of the little blue numbers, your life will be a masterpiece. Let me tell you something. That's a lie. So, here's our next exercise. What I'd like you to do is take a few minutes with the blue colored pencil that's at your table and your paper, and I want you to draw an image an image that represents the life that you feel society is kind of pushing you into. Uh, the constraining life. Lines, numbers, draw, if you will, your own little paint by number. Now, it may not represent an image. It may just be kind of a larger blob divided up with the paint by number numbers. But uh, I want you to draw that image. And uh, I'd like you to think about how, whether you're male or female, uh, those constraints may change. How the color of your skin has impacted the constraints that you feel. Maybe write in on some of those little spaces, finances or housing or who you marry or if you marry or where you live or anything that you can think of. The pressures that you have felt to comply to your family or our society and culture's image of who you can be in your life. I'd like you to draw an image of those things. So take a few minutes and finish up that exercise. OK, I think uh, you've had time to finish up. Now, now comes the fun part. What I'd like you to do is take the paint at your table and paint over your paint by number canvas. Now, if you want to, you can stay inside the lines. I don't recommend it, because it's not the life you were born to live. The god that we're learning about has given you a blank canvas. And so what I'd like you to do is paint something that represents the life you dream about living, the life you would live if God was really like this. If you really had the permission to live the life that you wanted, what would your life be like? Again, some of you have more artistic talent than others. I get that. But just at least show us whether you're going to stay inside the lines or paint outside the lines. Use vivid colors. 
and take a few minutes to paint the life you were really born to live. And I'll look forward to talking again in just a moment. I think you've had enough time to paint what it is you want to paint over that color by number canvas. Some of you stayed inside the lines, some of you painted outside the lines, I, I don't know, but I hope that what you painted somehow represents the life you were born to live, the life that could be possible for you. And so what I'd like you to do now for the next few minutes is share amongst your table, just with your table, with the other people on your table, a couple of things. Number one, if you were to actually have that canvas like we talked about in the exercise and you handed it back to God and God unrolled it, what would God immediately say about the life that you painted? And number two, I'd like you to talk about this. As God unrolled that canvas, what is it that you would feel as he began to look at the life that you feel you were born to live, this masterpiece that you've painted? How would you feel about it? when God begins looking at your painting. Take a few minutes and talk about this at your table. Okay, last exercise, really. I want you to take a few minutes and grab a piece of the clay that's on your table. Now, some of you have already done that, and that's okay. But um, take the clay that you have on your table, and I want you to make something, mold something that is a reminder of what you think God may really be like. Now, obviously, your artistic talent uh, may get in your way here. It doesn't have to be fancy, or it can be fancy. But just pick something about God that you love and make a representation of that thing with your clay. I was thinking earlier today, maybe it's just a heart because you realize that God is love and Everybody can mold a heart out of clay. But don't let that stop you. Mold whatever it is that you love most about God. Take just a few minutes and, and take that clay and make something. Put your fingers in it, get them dirty, and mold something that represents what you love about God. This is something that you're going to take home to remind you of how much you love about this God that we're learning about. Okay. Okay, artists. Sculpt away. So the quest today has been a little bit of a different format. My hope is that you get the idea that God is like a kindergarten teacher. And I don't know what that means to you, so let me describe my experience in kindergarten. My kindergarten teacher's name was Miss Baker. I don't remember if it's Miss or Mrs., but probably Mrs., but she was a remarkable woman. She was remarkable because of the way she made me feel about kindergarten. I couldn't wait to get there every day. Now in New Jersey, in the kindergarten that I grew up in, we had, I was a morning kindergartner. We had morning kindergartners that went till around lunchtime and then an afternoon class that came in after. And there are things that I remember about Mrs. Baker. One was that this woman was remarkably patient. She was patient. We had to do an awful lot of things before she would get upset. In fact, I don't remember her getting upset. God is patient that way. Sometimes God just smiles and looks at us, says, okay, are you done now? That was Miss Baker. She would be very patient with especially us kindergarten boys. The thing that I loved about her, the second thing I loved about her was that she was empowering. She helped me be a better me. She actually got to know me well enough so that she knew what I liked to do and what I didn't like to do. And although it wasn't as if she let me do what I liked to do all of the time at the expense of what I was supposed to be learning, Mrs. Baker allowed me to play with blocks more than uh, anyone else, really, I think. And again, this is a 48-year-old memory, right? But as I think back, Mrs. Baker did something that was amazing. She knew how much I loved building things out of blocks, and she made sure I had the time I needed to do that. Now, she made me try other things as well. I can remember playing in the sandbox and doing finger, uh, uh, finger painting and all, all kinds of other things. But the block time for me was the most beautiful time of the day. 
She was empowering. She helped me find what I was good at, and then she allowed me to do it. But the thing that I think I love most about this woman was that Mrs. Baker was pleased with my work. That was a remarkable thing for a six-year-old Joe Everly. I can remember, and again, some of my earliest memories, I can remember this woman asking me to leave my block structures intact so that the afternoon kindergarten class could see them. Now, looking back, I don't know if she took them down right after I left or not. But to that little boy, that teacher was the most amazing example of love. She was patient, empowering, and pleased with my work. And I want you to know, Quest, this morning, that's exactly how God feels about you. That's why I think that God is like a kindergarten teacher. And that's one of the reasons I love God like I do. So thank you for being here. Remember to take your clay home and your paintings if you'd like. I want to thank you for coming. And uh, David Reyes is going to come up and lead us in prayer. Have a great day, you guys. You may